Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be here today for the last day of the OpenStack Summit. Uh, I know it has been a really tough week and uh, all the parties and everything, so thank you very much for being here. Uh, I'm Sebastian, and I work as a cloud engineer at Innovance. Uh, Innovance is a multi-cloud provider, so we basically run, design, and build cloud platforms. We have uh, several domain of expertise, among others, OpenStack and Ceph. My daily job is mainly focused on OpenStack and Ceph, and I also rotate between the operational, the development, and uh, the pre-sale team. Apart, aside from this, I devote a fair, time of my, fair part of my time to blogging, so that's, uh, yeah. here are the details, my personal blog and company blog, so don't hesitate to to have a look at them. During the next 30 minutes, we will be discussing the Ceph integration into OpenStack. So I'm going to briefly introduce Ceph for those of you who are not familiar with it. Ceph is a unified distributed storage system that started in 2006 um, during Sage PhD. PhD. It's uh, open source under a GPL license, so well, no vendor locking, fully open source. It's mainly written in C++, and uh, well, it's basically building the future uh, of storage on commodity hardware, which is quite good actually because well, we don't have any restrictions, so we you can just uh, choose several hardware, really diverse hardware, to build your first cluster, and well, it evolves, well, according to you to your own needs, and it's also fairly easy to to run a park and do tests, so that's um, that's quite good. Ceph has. Uh, Numerous key features, um, such as self-managing and self-healing. The, the main point is a, it's a really dynamic cluster. So if something goes wrong, uh, if you lose a node or if you lose a disk, the self will just trigger uh, a recovery process because there, there are like tons of health check between each component. So as soon as uh, the cluster detects that something is wrong, well, uh, it will just self cleaning itself. It's uh, self-balancing, which means that uh, as soon as you add a new disk or add a new node, the cluster is dynamically load balanced. So all the data are just moving. Um, it's really planned for scaling because uh, it's fairly easy to add a new disk and to add, um, just add a new node. Thanks to the, the tremendous puppet modules, chef modules, and Ceph deploy. So now it's uh, really easy to deploy Ceph and um, also to, to, to scale Ceph. Ceph, um, as a, well, Ceph is really unique because it has a really, really cool feature called Crush, and it's uh, just a data placement. Crush is, um, well, stands for Control Replication and Scalable Hashing. It's a pseudo-random placement algorithm, uh, which means that we don't do any, well, it's just fast calculation. So every time we want to store an object into the, the cluster, we have to compute the, the location, so we don't store anything. Uh, into a hash table or something, we just always calculate the location, so it makes it deterministic, and it's, this is well, this is pretty good. Uh, it's statistically uniform distribution. Well, as mentioned earlier, uh, as soon as you add a new node, the whole cluster gets rebalanced, balanced, so that's uh, fairly easy to to take advantage of the full hardware. And it's a rule-based configuration. Uh, the really cool thing with Crush is that you can reflect your physical. Well, you can logically logically reflect your physical infrastructure. So basically you have a, well, Crushes is a map, and uh, within the map you have like the, your hardware topology and the topology of your physical infrastructure. So you have your nodes, you have your disks, and um, it's rule-based configuration. And what I just said, it's topology aware, and then you can build rules, and within these rules you can just specify replication count and things like that, so that's, um, that's something really unique. And uh, the really cool thing is that you can just uh, specify that you have several hardware, you have the diverse hardware, you have SSD-based systems, and you have SATA disk system. So you can just say, OK, within this pool, uh, store all the objects on SSDs or store on the objects uh, on the SATA. So that's, um, that's quite useful to have a really good placement algorithm. Just to give you, um, well, the final big picture of Ceph, this is um, how Ceph looks like. So everything is, is built upon the Rados uh, object store, so everything is stored as an object. 
And just on top of this, we, have, we build several, um, several components. So you have several ways to access your, your data and to store data. But first, you have the libRados. Uh, it's just a library to access the Rados cluster. So you can basically build your own application. And then from this, you can just uh, write and access all the objects. So it's fairly easy to plug with the libRados because it has several language bindings. It has Python, C++, Ruby, Java, and well, a lot of languages binding. Um, what the first component of that is called Rados Gateway is the, um, it's more, it's just a RESTful API, uh, the, just uh, really equivalent as uh, what Amazon S3 does and what OpenStack Swift does. They, um, it's just a RESTful API, so you, um, oh sorry, it's, it has multi-tenant um, capabilities and it does quota as well. You can do, uh, it supports, supports geo replication and also uh, disaster recovery features. Then the second component is called RBD. It's, uh, it stands for Rados Block Device. And it's uh, divided into two pieces. So the first one is a kernel module, part of the kernel. So you can basically create a device and then map it on your machine. So you have a new logical R draft disk. It's uh, well, quite useful. It's just the same way as ASCUZ does if you want. Um, and then the second piece is uh, just the QMU KVM driver. So you can create images that are thin provisioned and um, they support snapshotting and copy on write clones, full or incremental. So that's uh, really useful and it's well integrated into Xen and KVM. <coughs> then the last part of Ceph is the dis distributed file system. It's called CephFS and it's uh, the POSIX compliant file system that supports snapshotting as well. Uh, worth mentioning that uh, all the pieces are really robust, well, except CFFS, which is, well, not really, um, how do you say this? Uh, it's not production ready. That's, um, sorry? Almost yeah, almost, I think that's safe. Yeah, it's mentioning always. Yeah, almost awesome because everything is really robust and already really good. So that's, uh, we are almost there to have, um, to have a fully unified storage. Um, now it's, um, some of the first consideration while building your first Ceph cluster. It's uh, really performance oriented, uh, but it's just a general, um, just like a methodology when you want to build your first Ceph cluster. Uh, the thing is how to start. Uh, first of all, you need a use case. And well, we need, within this use case, you have to establish several rules, uh, like, a, well, Ideally, you might be able to tell, okay, um, I'm more doing IOPS or I'm more doing bandwidth or perhaps it's mixed, but uh, this will ridiculously change the way that you build your cluster. If uh, you want more IOs, you want just fastest disk with more IOPS, and if you want bandwidth, you might want a really large network bandwidth, for example. Um, you might want to also establish sort of a guaranteed IOPS for this. Uh, so Ideally, you would like to be able to tell, okay, I want to deliver this amount of IOPS and this amount of bandwidth for uh, all of my customers individually. Well, obviously, it's really hard, difficult to, to tell us, but well, if you can, let's just do it. Um, you definitely want to know if you use Ceph as a standalone solution or if you use Ceph combined with the software solution, if you use with uh, OpenStack or other cloud solution, for example, <coughs> because it's, um, at some point, if you have like performance issues, you must really want to know that uh, this is implemented that way. But first of all, you know how Ceph works basically, and you know how it's implemented with your software solution. So if something goes wrong, you, you know directly how to look. So that's um, something that you want to consider as well. Then you need to establish, well, what's the amount of data that you want to start with? Um, and usable data, not rope. Then you need to tell, okay, um, Ceph does the replication, so it's just, um, you can specify replica count. You should just start to decide if you want to start with two, three, four, or more. Um, ideally, you would like to establish also a failure ratio, which means that uh, when you build a cluster, you don't really want to build high density nodes. Uh, if you have 100 terabytes, for example, you don't really want to build three, well, each node with uh, 33 terabytes each, because if you lose a node, well, you have a lot of data to rebalance. So, you need to just establish like um, a percentage ratio of the data that you're willing to load balance if something goes wrong according to performance. And uh, because as soon as, you, as soon as you recover, well, you have to write a little bit more and client keeps writing too. So that's um, kind of something that you 
one definitely want to consider too. Uh, ideally, you would like to have also a data growth planning. Um, if you know that, I don't know, maybe every six months you are getting 10 more or 100 more terabytes, this will uh, definitely change the way that you build your initial cluster. Uh, so maybe you will spend a little bit more of money, but uh, every six months that's going to be, well, way easier to, uh, to scale. And well, obviously uh, you need a budget, so I'll, I won't go through any consideration about the budget, but uh, yeah, you definitely need something that back um, all your requirements. Uh, things that you must not do, but uh, I just want to highlight that don't get me wrong, this is really performance oriented, so obviously everything is doable there, but if you, if you want to avoid like unnecessarily uh, troubleshooting, you might want to follow these this considerations. Um, usually you don't want to put a red underneath your OSDs, but the OSD is the object storage daemon, and the general recommendation is just to use one disk for one OSD. Um, step already does the replication, so it's quite, well, use, useless to, uh, to do more replication with that, so you lose space and, uh, yeah, it's not quite efficient. Just also <coughs> think that the, because you don't necessarily only want to do red one arrays, you can also, also do red zero if you really want to burst your performances, but um, the graded red breaks the performance and then if you don't have the right tool to monitor everything, you might get into trouble because usually the, well, what we tend to do is that the, um, the speed of your cluster is uh, the speed of your, well, the slowest disk within the entire cluster. So if you don't want to drop down all the performances or have like spikes, um, well, just um, don't, do, don't do this. Uh, as mentioned earlier, you don't really want to build high density nodes with a tiny cluster because you might have a lot of things to load balance and then potentially get a cluster full if you have too many data to, to load balance. Um, uh, we could argue on the last one that don't run stuff on your hypervisors. Um, as mentioned, uh, this is doable obviously, but uh, and at some point you might think that uh, you, you could get like way more performance because if you if you have your uh, storage layer and your uh, hypervisor layer on the hypervisor, then you can just directly access your cluster. So the first hit is just really fast because you eat, loc eat locally and the second one is a little bit less, but well, that's um, my main concern there is about memory and about also, and also about consistency on the platform. Usually storage server does do only storage and hypervisor, they only do memory. Um, Ceph needs memory as well because it, well, uh, the more memory you have, the better for system caching you can get. So uh, in this case, both of them require um, memory. So Ceph wants memory and obviously the hypervisor wants memory. So yeah, at the end, you just end up with a really huge battle with memory. But well, this, it's mainly an assumption. Um, now let's dive into the state of the integration into Havana. So basically WhatsApp is so good with OpenStack because it unifies all the components. Um, uh, originally it was present uh, in Glance and then in Cinder and uh, recently in Havana. So it unifies all the components so you just have this uh, really single layer of storage and then all the components are plugged into the storage layer which is quite good because you don't need to have like a diverse storage solution for solutions for one component or another. You just have the same abstraction for storage and that's, that's quite good. Um, Havana's best addition, well, first of all, there, there were a complete refactor of the, the Cinder driver, so now it, it uses the Librados and the LibRBD. Um, this is really cool because uh, we can get a better error handling for that, and, uh, but that's, uh, that's something that we had to do. Uh, thanks just for, for doing that, by the way. Uh, we have new features like flatten volumes while creating a snapshot. Because what happened on the background is that um, if, this, if Cinder detects that the, um, that Ceph is also the backend storage for Glance, when you create a new volume, then it creates a, a clone from this. So if you, want, if you don't really want to have like too, too much dependency on the chaining of the snapshots and the clone, you might want to just flatten the snapshot uh, every time you create the volume. And we have also a new policy about clone depth, so that's also what I just said. Uh, as soon as you create more, vol uh, more clones, you at some point you just want to say stop and then flatten the original image and then continue cloning everything. 
Then uh, Cinder Packup was uh, already present uh, in Grizzly, but uh, the only backend was Swift. So now we can uh, we can do backups from Ceph to Ceph as well. This is well, the way we can do it is just you can you can backup within the same pool, which is not recommended because it's just the same machine. So you don't isolate anything between domain failures. But if you if you have different pools, this definitely points to different machines. So, well, you can isolate that. Um, well, ideally, you do DR with, that, with, this, uh, with this feature. So you have one location and you have another Ceph cluster running on another data center. Um, it supports RBD stripes. And uh, the really important thing is that differential. So we, do, we already do actually incremental backups uh, when backupping Ceph from Ceph with another cluster. Um, I know that yesterday we had a discussion with the guys uh, for implementing an incremental uh, API for, for backups, but it's just already there if you use Ceph. And um, one of, well, at least for me, one of the biggest traditions for Havana around Ceph is the Nova Librid image type. Uh, originally, this, uh, this flag is set to file, which means that every time you create a new virtual machine, you get a file on the system under uh, well, leave Nova instances um, instant UUID, and this file is just the root, file, the root disk of your virtual machine. You also have a second implementation with LVM, so you specify your volume group, and then every time you boot a machine, it creates a new LV, and then it attaches to the KVM process. Now what it does is you specify a new pool of Ceph, a new Ceph pool, and then you create a new RBD image, and you just connect the, the pointer to the KVM process. So you just directly boot all the VMs within Ceph. Uh, this is definitely an, op an operator decision, so the, um, the client or the user doesn't, doesn't know anything about this. Uh, this was a really huge requirement for, from the community and from our customers too, to just, uh, can I just boot everything within Ceph uh, instead of always doing um, boot from volumes, for example. So it's kind of hard to automate boot from volumes into I done everything. So now we can just directly boot everything with Ceph, which makes uh, operation like uh, live migration way easier. Yes? Uh, it's only for KVM. Yeah. Yeah, the question was it, is it only with, uh, is it also compatible with Xen? Um, and yeah, sorry, but <laughs> okay. Um, it's not a Nova, well, it's a part of the Nova and the Cinder edition too. So now uh, OpenStack supports QoS, uh, which is quite good because uh, Ceph doesn't do any QoS at the moment. So ev every IO request are just restricted from the hypervisor itself. So this is quite useful to allocate a certain amount of IOPS or, or bandwidth for, uh, from your hypervisor itself. It's uh, bound with uh, Cinder volume type, so that's, um, that's good. Um, that's the big picture of the, today's Havana integration. So <clears throat> what we do is we can just boot a VM, so it goes into Ceph, and then we can attach a volume, so it's also calling Cinder for doing that. And uh, we can also do Nova Evacuate. Yeah, that was the point before the question. Um, live migration is made easier when you have everything into Ceph, so because you just uh, have to move the KVM process, and then you just reconnect the link. Uh, on the um, on the RBD image, so it's like just like really really fast. Um, Nova, it's also fairly easy to trigger Nova Evacuate. If you lose a compute node, you can do either Nova Evacuate or Host Evacuate, and it's already on the Ceph cluster. But if you have this on the um, directly on the hypervisor, it's quite hard to reboot the virtual machine. Um, and it's just like the workflow, as I just explained it earlier. Uh, we have the multi backend capabilities, so. As soon as we create a volume, we just do a copy on write clone. Um, and we do just our RBD incremental backups uh, on the second location. But the question is, is Havana the perfect stack? Well, um, unfortunately, it's, um, om we are almost there, I would say. We are missing some, uh, some really tiny features. Uh, the problem is that we, we were about to submit a new patch, and then the patch was rejected, rejected because uh, we were just after a feature freeze. So um, now what it does, it's um, you just create a new VM, 
um, the compute, uh, well, Glens downloads the image and stream, into the stream the image into the compute node. So you have to download the image on the compute node through Glens. And then you have to import it into CEP, which is, which is quite inefficient. Um, but Josh has, Josh has already a patch, uh, and it's already on the pipe. So <coughs> the, idea here, the idea here is just to do the same thing as we do already with uh, Cinder. So when we create a new VM, and if the, um, Glens, if the image is already present in Glens, then we just do a copy and write clone. So it's just really fast to, to boot a new VM. So that will probably be for um, the bug we release for, uh, for Havana. Um, one of the things that is not implemented is the, uh, the Ceph sn snapshotting. So now every time you want to, um, even if you boot a VM into Ceph, and if you take the snapshot of the instance, what happens is that, well, this does the really common, really common snapshot with QMU. So you have to download the image. Um, well, you just snapshot the instance, and it goes locally on the compute node, and then it goes into Glens. Um, but in the future, we could just uh, call a step snapshot, so the, uh, the operation is quite in. Well, you can do this instantly. Uh, if you're in a hurry to go into, to go into production, and, that, and if you really want to, um, to patch everything, I think there are just only three bugs, and uh, George already um, uh, build a new branch for that, so this is the real if you really want to fix everything already. A little bit about the roadmap, uh, ISOS roadmap and, uh, and beyond. This is, um, at least for me, this is really personal once again, but uh, this could be the self integration for ISOS and maybe for uh, Jay. Um, what's missing is um, something that you might want to do is to, uh, to have the ability to store snapshots and images into different pools, because at some point you just want a replica count of two, for example, for the images, but potentially snapshots contains, contain customer's data, so you might want a re higher replica level, like three, for example. Um, this is something that we just want to trick. Um, While well, the QCO implementation is already on the, uh, is already on the pub, so it's um, not worth mentioning it uh, for uh, the, the ISOS roadmap. Um, Things that, well, we would like to see is the migration support because currently Ceph doesn't support the volume migration under Cinder. Basically, the volume migration is when you want to migrate from one backend to another, uh, NFS backend into whatever other backend, but it's not supported when you use Ceph. Um, something that we could easily implement is the Nova bare metal function. Uh, the bare metal is basically when you want to boot a new VM. It's actually not really a VM. It's more a compute node, so it's a dedicated type of... Uh, well, bare metal machine for, uh, for your customer. Uh, thanks to the kernel module, we could just easily enable the kernel module and then create a new RBD device and just map it to, uh, to the physical host. So that could be really easy to do. Um, there is also this LFS implementation going on, which is just, um, just a RESTful, uh, really a, well, agnostic RESTful API, which can call talk with uh, Redos and with uh, a Swift, Swift cluster. So ideally, you will have this LFS API that talks to, to your Ceph cluster. So it's, uh, it's not really a replacement for, for Swift or things like that, but it's just that, uh, well, basically for the OpenStack, you could also use the, the object store from, from Ceph, um, from the dashboard or whatever. So you we will get a complete unified storage solution because that's gonna be just like everywhere. Um, and well, potentially um, the Manila support. Uh, Manila support is an initiative from NetApp, I guess, and it's the distributed file system as a service solution. So we could also just uh, just add a new driver for for CFS and uh, just create a new distributed file system for uh, one of our customer because it's uh, also a really huge requirement for uh, legacy applications to to use a distributed file system. This is. Um, well, this is the high house uh, roadmap, but it's just basically what I, what I just said earlier with the picture, but it's just for you guys to, uh, to have the, this kind of reminder there. Um, what's coming up at, uh, in Ceph for, um, for the next release? Uh, we don't have that much like really new fancy features for Emperor, so we just directly jump for a Firefly, uh, which should be landed in February 2013. Uh, we have the cheering functionality, which is the um, basically you have this notion of uh, cold and uh, hot storage. So 
So you, you can have like a, a pool uh, that has a bunch of SSDs and then everything goes into this pool and then, well, periodically we just flush everything on the, on the back end with SataDisk when the data is less requested. We have the erasure coding with it, which is just, uh, well, more or less like a RED5 uh, on um, software-defined storage uh, fashion. So you, you can just like have a really large compression of your data. Um, a ZFS support for the, for the file system of the OSD, it's quite good because we, uh, but it's really, really, really deep detail for this. Um, so. It's just a um, good thing because we can use write parallel modes with the journal, so we just do the same thing as we are supposed to do with ButterFS, but since it's not production ready, we can't use it. Um, so that's, um, that's definitely good that we can have the, the ZFS support. And obviously we will do um, well, all the efforts that we can to uh, fully support the OpenStack uh, ICE house release. It's, um, it's both ink tank and community roadmap, so that's, um, that's it. Um, that's it for me. So <clears throat> I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. And uh, if you have any questions, it's time for, uh, for questions. Uh, made it pretty fast here, so we, uh, we have like 15 minutes for, for questions. So um, yes. Yes. It's more Nova, but. Yeah, but, well, actually, it doesn't support QCAL2. Every time you do this, you must ensure that the image is in a raw format. So if the image, well, the image is already in Glance, and it's already a raw format. So, yeah, but the question is, yeah, it does QCAL because we do a clone. So it's copy and white cloning. Yeah, because what we do is, uh, as soon as we store the image into Glance, uh, the image is snapshotted and protected, and then from the specific snapshot, we just run a bunch of clones as soon as we create a new virtual machine. Yes? I'm not really familiar with LFS, but as far as I know, and if someone knows more, more about this, uh, feel free to jump in and explain us what LFS is. But basically, it's just a RESTful API, uh, agnostic RESTful API that can talk to several whatever object storage backend. So you just, uh, you just do a request on LFS, and then you can have a, either a Swift backend object store or a Rados object store. So it's just a way to unify all the APIs and just to have a single abstraction layer and no matter which object storage you have underneath. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I really have no idea. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and I don't really know the status or know the progress of the implementation. So I, I, we should ask the GlusterFS guys because they, they initiated the uh, initiative so yeah yes yeah the second is you and then yeah. yes encryption uh, I know that there is something but it's uh, self specific and there is also something on encryption but I barely looked at it so I I don't have the answer sorry about the encryption uh, I know that there is a there is a module that might have needed for Havana but I'm not sure if it does any yeah, I, I just don't know if they. Uh, that does add up to this encryption and go to those conditions, but I think there's a separate effort to do the rewrite of the Ember language and things like that. That's that's a that's a tough problem. Yeah, it's always really complex because you don't really know where to store the key and everything. I know there is a project on this, like Barbican or something, that does the uh, well key management system. No, the key key management is the Ember module. So. Okay. Uh, that was you and then the, okay. Um, it, it seems really just for a bunch of machines, but is there something you can recommend that we could look at? Oh, um, 
Well, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I mainly work on Debian-based systems. Uh, I, I don't know about the, any kernel recommendation. Maybe you know, Sage. Uh, I think I think Sage is uh, the definitely the person to ask is if Any more questions? Yes? What is the symbol? Four. No. There, there, are, there, there is no single point of failure because it, it doesn't work like Swift, for example, where you have like this proxy that requests the object stores. You directly talk to the object servers. So you don't have any single entry points to, ret to retrieve your data. Uh, you just directly talk with the object servers. Okay, the question was if there were any spoof on, on Ceph. Uh, about uh, yeah. their largest uh, installation? Largest installation? Well, as far as I know, it's uh, five petabytes, Dreamworks, or uh, more or less, yeah, five petabytes, yeah. Um, any more questions? Yeah, sorry. So of all the use cases that you've talked about, you said there are lots of integration costs, but of all of those, which is the most common to use right now? Is there a few good what is, com what, is, what is more commonly used? The, like you said, Glad, Cinder, and now you're also talking about integration with some of the other components. Yes. Like it's really flexible, so no, there is no specific use case for that. No. Yeah. Do you have something like a rule of thumb using um, each registration? Like you said, it's not. Yeah. Um, oh, so what's the amount of? Um, well, how many disks should I put into a single machine? Yeah. Well, you have into you have to take into consideration many things. Uh, what's your network bandwidth? Well, what do you want to achieve? Also, if you're like really uh, high ops, uh, well, from a high ops perspective. You can pack a lot of IOPS on a gigabit link. So you can do like half an SSD and then your net gigabit net network bandwidth is full. If you have 10 gig, obviously you are like limited almost. Um, but in terms of bandwidth, um, if, you, if, you are, if, you want, if you want to achieve performance in terms of bandwidth, uh, just keep in mind that a single SATA enterprise hard drive disk uh, can just fulfill your whole gigabit bandwidth. Then if you go with a 10 gigabit network, uh, you have to think about, um, so well, you can mostly deliver, well, 1.2 uh, gig. And uh, Ceph has a really specific design, which means that first you eat the journal and then you flush the data. So basically this more or less split into two, uh, the IOs and then the bandwidth. So general recommendation is 12 disks uh, per machine, but you can go to 24 if, um, but well, that's only the theory on the bandwidth. If you go with 24, you just can just fulfill the entire bandwidth and the whole server. But just make sure that uh, the red controller supports it. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, if you want to use an SSD, for example, just to burst the performance and don't have any um, impact, because uh, as soon as you hit the disk, you hit uh, at 50 megabytes, for example, and then you flush at 50. But if you use an SSD, the FSD just absorbs everything. But one more time, if you don't don't put too many OSDs on a single uh, SSD, so uh, based on work calculation, you have like well, an enterprise SSD can deliver 500 megs sequential writes per second because the journal is only sequential. 
Um, so if you just put like four OSDs, you go around uh, less, a little bit more than 100. So you, you, you need to establish your own ratio for that, but traditionally I recommend like six OSDs uh, for a single journal, uh, which leads to, well, 12 disks in the end, and then you already fulfilled your gigabit bandwidth. Um, I don't know that much about InfiniBand, but uh, I've been doing that, so they just, this will change everything if you go to InfiniBand, but with gigabit, with a gigabit link, yeah, that's the, the answer. Um, that's um, gonna be pretty soon on the internet, yeah. I'm gonna post it on Slideshare, and uh, that's gonna be tweeted by Innovance, definitely, so you, you won't find it anywhere. I'll grab you an email if you want. Okay, that's, yeah, gonna be soon on the internet. Yes? The region support? The ratio? Yeah, okay. Oh, the universal coding. Uh, yeah, and that's what you're asking about? Okay, and? <laughs> I'm sorry, what's the, what, what's the question? <laughs> Are you guys doing? What are you guys doing for? I'm not doing anything for it. I'm not the main developer of the erasure coding. And I'm not sure it's, uh, it does, it's like there. I, I don't know. But uh, I mean, it's, yeah, once again, Sage knows about it. Yeah. We have two more minutes, otherwise we are, do you have any more questions? Okay, thank you very much everyone.